Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we're here to talk about our experience bringing Robo Recall to the Oculus Quest uh, to kick things off real quick. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, Robo Recall was Epic's one and only VR title shipped for the Oculus uh, Rift and the Oculus Touch controllers back in 2017, I believe. Uh, to date, it's one of the most popular titles on the store. It's still going. Uh, high action, ripping robots apart, lots of physical animation, really fun. Um, and about, uh, I guess a little over a year ago, uh, Oculus and Epic reached out to us to bring uh, that experience to the Oculus Quest, which if, was born Robo Recall Unplugged. If you guys aren't familiar with Oculus Quest, it's you know, Oculus's most recent VR headset using a mobile chipset, uh, the uh, Snapdragon 835, which is something that was popular in smartphones about two and a half years ago, I believe. So it was quite the feat to bring this photorealistic VR experience from desktop VR down into the mobile experience. Uh, before we go any further. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Toss. I'm the technical director at Drifter Entertainment. Uh, not so long ago, I worked for Epic Games, uh, primarily working on the Gears of War franchise with this gentleman right here. Um, eventually kind of left Epic and joined the startup scene and ultimately worked my way back around and joined forces with Ray again at Drifter about three years ago, or a little yeah. bit more than three years ago. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Ray Davis. I'm the CEO of Drifter. Former life, I was the programmer at Gears of War 1 and 2 and some other secret projects that will never see the light of day at Epic Games, sadly. I also was general manager for Unreal Engine, so some of you might have seen me on the early Twitch streams that we did way back in the day. Uh, and then, yeah, about three years ago, I started a Drifter and recruited this guy and, um, and a few other souls, and we've been making VR titles. Uh, we're based here in Seattle. Uh, to date, we've shipped three games. Robo Recall was the most recent one in May. Our first game, Gunheart, uh, is a co-op shooter. We shipped that for all the VR uh, platforms, Oculus Rift, Steam VR, all that good stuff, co-op shooter. And we also had the opportunity to uh, make a game for Ready Player One movie. Was that last year? I don't remember what it was. At yeah. some time we made a game. It was cool. Uh, Ready Player One was really fun. It was, a, again, a co-op uh, shooter experience built for uh, HTC and Warner Brothers. And then, uh, yeah, we're working on that other thing. Can't really talk about it right now, but it's a cool game, man. Uh, we'll talk about it soon, I Next hope. year. Next year. Hey, don't give away the date. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so basically what this talk is going to cover is a little bit of what we wish we knew when we were going into porting Robo Recall to the quests and kind of diving into the quests uh, for reels and you know, give you some tips, give you some, some gotchas to look out for and some, hopefully some pointers that will help you kind of jumpstart any production that you're going to do on the quests as you go along. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're going to start talking about, hey, with Unreal Engine, uh, you know, where is the time going? How to find out where your performance bottlenecks are? Um, and then kind of break that down, game thread, render thread, and GPU, and all that good stuff. And some fun examples, and of course, all your wonderful questions. Yeah, so as we're talking about um, profiling and optimization, I think it's, it's a good idea to kind of take a step back and get a better overall picture of what the engine is doing uh, and what the hardware is doing in concert with the engine to kind of build a better uh, plan going forward when you're figuring out what's slow and what actually is gonna be the best bang for buck to optimize. Um, so at least on the Quest, uh, the things that you have access to do that aren't being used by the tracking system or whatnot are the three gold cores and the GPU, of course. So uh, those coincide nicely with the, with the setup that Unreal has, um, which as you can see in the diagram, uh, there's the game thread, there's the render thread, the RHI thread. Game thread tends to be sort of like simulating all the game logic, doing uh, player movement, AI, all that kind of stuff, and handing off here, here is the frame that, that, and what should be drawn to the render thread, and the render thread ends up doing lots of kind of housekeeping and sorting and stuff like that, getting things ready to hand off to the GPU. And then there's this extra thread, uh, which you can turn on and off in Unreal Engine. We ended up uh, turning it on in Robo Recall because it gave us a little bit more uh, draw call overhead, which we'll talk about more in a second. But what that thread does is just simply takes draw calls from the render thread and hands them to the GPU ever so slowly over the bandwidth that's limited between the CPU and the GPU. And then the GPU does all your normal GPU things. It uh, fills triangles, runs shader code, all that kind of stuff. So um, it just, it's a good idea to always come back to this and, and keep it in mind when you're profiling and it's like, okay, what is this thread actually doing? Uh, and, the, and then also understanding the relationship between these threads because in an ideal world, they're all running in parallel. They're all happily not blocking each other, which you know doesn't always happen. But if one of these threads ends up going over the 13.8 millisecond barrier, which is 72 frames a second, which is what the Quest runs at, you can actually end up in a situation where one thread is causing all the other threads to wait for it because it has to finish doing its thing before the render thread can go off or whatever. So this can cause some confusion when you're profiling because you're like, 
well, all the threads are slow. You know, where do I go look? And so it, if, if you kind of know that this cascading effect can happen, it makes it a little bit easier when you're looking around to say like, okay, this one's waiting for this one, this is waiting for this one, which is the problem is actually over here. So it's a little bit of a shell game. Yeah, and I would say as, as we go on, most of the stuff is just general good practices of optimizing games, period, um, especially tailored to uh, Unreal Engine. There's a little bit of stuff that's specific to VR and Oculus Quest as well. The real challenge with Oculus Quest is it just, you know, the, the available compute that we're dealing with, right? Um, fortunately in Unreal, you have this really handy tool called StatUnit. Hopefully everybody in this room is already familiar with it, but just in case, we're gonna run through it again. Uh, and this is really just the first process of like, game is slow, where do we start, right? Um, so when we jump in, you know, we put StatUnit, you're gonna see three numbers, I guess actually four numbers in some cases, if you've modified it. Uh, but it'll break down, you know, milliseconds for a game thread, uh, render thread, and obviously what your GPU time is. Uh, in our case here, if we say, okay, game thread is the highest number, it's color coded, if it's green, you're good, if it's red, you're bad. Um, usually the next step then is to go ahead and just fire up the Unreal Script Profiler. And I hear there's this awesome new thing coming in the next version of Unreal Engine that is even cooler for profiling. But for our experience, uh, we're using the, the classic there. Uh, and that, you know, it's, uh, I think the man is like stat start file or whatever, to start capturing, you can capture normal gameplay or whatever, and then grab that off device and, and analyze it. And you'll, very quickly you can break down into the call graph and see exactly where your time is going, what frames and group of frames and all that. Um, and then of course, once you've identified the problem, it's usually, we'll talk a bit more about what kind of problems you might run into in that. Yeah, so if you're looking at stat unit and, and the game thread seems happy, and then you're looking at either the render thread or the RHI thread being a bit, bit over, uh, the first place to start is to look at how many draw calls you have. And uh, maybe now is a good time to talk about draw calls on the Quest. Uh, it's, it's very limited compared to the PC especially, and, and it's kind of non-intuitive because you think draw call and it's like, oh, it's, you know, what's taking the time? Is it the GPU actually drawing what the draw call is telling it to do? And in the Quest case, at least, you're actually CPU bound. So the CPU is sitting there waiting for the driver to respond. Uh, so that actually is just sort of like a overhead of the platform. Uh, and so a lot of times when you have a lot of draw calls, what you'll see is it's actually slow either in the render thread or the RHA thread because it's just waiting to hand those things off to the GPU. But uh, as, it, as it points out here, the first thing to do is to grab a render.capture. Um, and uh, the reason why that's super useful is because you can go through each draw call and kind of figure out where all your draw calls are going. And we'll go into that a bit more in a bit. Um, but from there, once you kind of have a better idea of what the scene is doing, you can decide what to do a bit more informed and you can either you know, delete stuff, that's my favorite, uh, or use HLOT or merging instancing, depending on what the situation is. Yeah, yeah, we'll go into HLOD, previs, computed, all kinds of fun things in yeah. the engine to, to work with there. Um, and then certainly on the GPU, render doc is probably your best friend ever. Yeah, actually, I mean, the GPU is obviously gonna be slow in lots of situations as well, but again, render doc is your friend. Um, you, can, you can look at the timings of the draw call, draw calls themselves, which is different than the draw call overhead that's incurred on the CPU. Uh, you can actually look at how long each draw call is taking on the GPU to figure out like not only well, after the draw call is issued, but you know, is the shader code taking a long time? Is, is there something that's slow on the GPU for some reason other than just the fact that it's a draw call? But uh, render doc is always what you should come back to to kind of figure that out. And then from there you can decide, okay, this one draw call is just taking a whole lot of time because the shader is really slow, we need to optimize the shader or right. you know, switch away from translucency that we did that Yeah, yeah, our, our target material instruction counts are much, much lower on the Oculus Quest as you expect. And then yeah, things like translucency are just a no-go because they trigger a full frame resolution or resolve because it's a tiled renderer, um, which is almost like a four millisecond hit, which, you know, if we've got 13.8 milliseconds, there's no room for four milliseconds of, of post-process, unfortunately. Uh, as Matt mentioned, you know, our, our target for Oculus Quest is about 250 draw calls uh, on PC, the min spec for Robo Recall. And remember, this min spec is still pretty awesome, all things considered. The 970 GPU by NVIDIA, uh, like a core i5 or something like that, um, you know, they were pushing 1,000 plus draw calls in some scene, and so there was a lot of work to, to squish that down and, and try to preserve. I guess one thing I forgot to mention too with this project is, you know, we're big fans of the game, um, and have a history with the game, the Rover Recall on the Rift, and one thing I felt very strongly about moving forward is I wanted to make sure if we brought this to the Quest, we wanted to preserve that same game. Uh, you know, obviously we have to cut down the visuals quite a bit, but, you know, maintain the same physical interactions, the ripping, same mission content, all that good stuff. Thankfully, we were successful. But it made it a lot harder than it needed to be. <laughs> um, as far as triangles, it was what, about 350, I guess, is what we're targeting. Um, and then, yeah, especially uh, a lot of work on the materials and simplifying that. I don't know if you want to talk about Switching more. away from translucency was a big, was a big uh, pain point. Uh, you, you can get away with additive in most cases, uh, but you know, 
you kind of have to do some work back on the art side to make things look the way that it was intended or at least close enough. And uh, the, then memory was the other you know, massive difference between uh, like a, a desktop SKU. And it was, it's not that bad. I mean, 2.1 gigabytes is pretty good compared to say a, a Xbox 360 or something like that. But it definitely took some uh, effort to get things to fit because when you make a game for PC and you don't have to worry about memory, yeah, I would say is sort of in hindsight, we talk about this a lot. It's very similar in experience for those of you who remember shipping games for the original like Xbox 360 or maybe even PlayStation 2. You know, there's, it's kind of similar -ish budgets that we're working with. So um, some of those techniques of, of building content for those, those budgets are they're back, in, uh, back in fashion, right? Um, yeah, and the saving grace is you know, Oculus Quest targets 72, 72 hertz instead of uh, 90, uh, but the CPU itself, it's, it's not apples to apples, right? So that 13.8 that goes away a lot quicker than you would expect. Um, yeah, digging more on the game thread. Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna kind of split out game thread side stuff and then rendering stuff we'll, do, we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so a lot of these are just sort of like checkboxes, hopefully, uh, that will get you a bit of a leg up when you're starting your production in Quest. The first thing that we ran into is that by default, um, at least it was when we were working on it, maybe they've changed it by now. Hopefully it's been merged back yeah, in. Um, <laughs> it, uh, Unreal Engine sort of looks at the number of free cores, and on Quest it's three because one of the gold cores is taken up by the, the tracking inside-out tracking system. And so it would, it would slam all most things, anyway, into the game thread and run it single-threaded for the most part. But in a game like Robo Recall, uh, which has a lot of physics going on, this is what we hit initially anyway, uh, the, you know, the physics would run in the game thread and slow everything down, and so we would spill over the 13.8 millisecond uh, barrier quite often. So we found, and you know, our solution was a little bit more graceful than what's in the screenshot here, just commenting <laughs> it out. But uh, basically, you just want to tell the engine to use all the, co all the cores that it can, put everything on the task graph that it can so that you get audio and physics and IO and all that good stuff running on multiple threads. The main caveat here uh, is it, it is a pretty constrained environment with only three cores. So sometimes you can get task graph saturation and you'll get you know, long stalls occurring where it's, it's waiting 100 milliseconds just to start the task. And that's definitely something to look out for. The good news there is that if you can see those pretty easily in the gameplay profiler. You'll just see a, you know, a giant spike of it sitting there waiting for a task graph or a parallel four or something like that. And so in our case, we just sort of like ran around and played the game and found when that was happening. And one of the big ones is the parallel physics, um, like when it's blending the physics back in from the physics thread into the game thread. So we just turned that off. There's, you know, Epic guys have nice C bars everywhere. So we just turned the C bar off and that actually completely removed all the, the stalls and we were good to go. And then we could um, make use of those cores without any downside. So. Uh, I, 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 just to make a point here, as a licensee, as an external developer, having worked both inside and outside of Epic, my favorite thing to do is comment out large chunks of code. <laughs> You're like, what the hell is this? I don't need that. That's what happens if I turn it off? Yes. And then it just, you know, you regret your choices later in life when you're integrating the new, you know, sexy version, but so on. Um, yeah, we definitely, one of the big ways this became possible is blueprint nativization. You want to break it down? Sure, yeah, so nativization is, is a feature that's built into the engine, has been since, I think, Ro the original Robo Recall shipped, uh, which basically just tries to go compile all the blueprint code into C++ code, and then you don't suffer the penalties of the virtual machine uh, overhead. Um, and that's another one of the sort of theoretically simple box ticking, you just turn it on. But in our case, it, it required quite a bit of effort to actually get to work. The Blueprint compiler has changed quite a bit since Rubber Recall shipped initially, so we had you know, lots of issues that we had to work through. And in some cases, we just sort of fixed the engine problems, and in some cases, we just worked around them. One example is uh, any sort of default objects that were defined in the Blueprint with, with parameter overrides, like say a collision sphere, and you're changing the collision channels or something like that, would end up just being zeros uh, when it was running in game. So it didn't crash, it didn't assert, it just sort of like subtly broke gameplay. Those are always primo bugs to find. Um, so eventually we just had some code that was sort of like, okay, this thing is supposed to be this, but we're actually gonna reset all these parameters on begin play because they're getting zeroed, but those it's kind are, of a hacky workaround, but it's yeah, a trick. Yeah, they're called shipping hacks, right? He, yeah. he who ships wins. Um, yeah, and the big impact, as you can see roughly in that graph, is even the steady state, two milliseconds, which is non-trivial again, that's like a huge percentage of our frame time. Um, but in the worst case, like when you're in high combat action or whatever, um, you know, 10, upwards of 10 milliseconds saved, which is, is hard to... Yeah, I'd say the, the biggest benefit is, is those spike situations where you've got a frame where the player fired, there's uh, physical animations getting turned on, there's particle effects playing, you know, ragdoll getting triggered, stuff happening all over the place, all in one frame. In blueprint land, that can spike up 
like really high. And in, when you're nativized, you just sort of flatten all that stuff out. You don't have to do all the, the blueprint thunking back around that can stack up, especially on a slow, slow CPU. Kind of reminds me, when we first got the game kind of working on the platform and we got those first profiles, I felt like I needed like a support group because you can just <laughs> see like 100 milliseconds being like, there's no way we can do this, but stick with it. Why is uh, move component so slow? I know, <laughs> death by a million cuts. Uh, the other one is the classic rule is blueprints is fantastic for moving fast, rapid iteration, all that, but it is just inherently slower. Um, and so just strongly, you know, if you have existing content bringing over, you know, identifying those key parts, manually writing that code in C++ is almost guaranteed to do better than the automatic version. Um, so I, I just, especially if you're starting a new project for Oculus Quest or another similar platform, just plan that in your production process of like, okay, this is key fundamental systems have the native layer. And that also has some advantages that, uh, of breaking up your content references that we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, Digging in, uh, yeah, Robo is a very animation-heavy game, and it's using a ton of physical animation integration to sort of achieve the, achieve the visual style and the interactions. Um, but it was really slow, surprise. Uh, <laughs> one of the first things you do, this is pretty obvious, uh, blueprint evaluation, or sorry, anim graph evaluation has a fast path where it tr tries to not invoke the blue, uh, blueprint VM. Highly recommend to do that. Um, the way you do is you just cache your various uh, logic conditions for the transitions between your uh, states or whatnot using like a low frequency timer in the anim graph itself versus in the actual anim, uh, sorry, the link graph. Uh, and also just, again, to Matt's earlier comment, delete where possible. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that the player just will not notice that end up being expensive. So uh, calling that stuff or using sort of a player proximity approach to uh, reduce that stuff if the object is not gameplay relevant. In the case of Robo Recall, it's a single player experience, so we were able to leverage player proximity for a ton of things, especially physics. You know, we very quickly ran into situations where the physics thread would <laughs> jump off and go on a vacation for 100 milliseconds or so. Um, and it was just because the scene was too complex or too many simulating bodies and, and those overlaps and all that. Um, so one of our big wins would say, hey, anything not within, say, 10 to 15 meters, I don't remember the exact number, let's go ahead and dynamically turn off physics animation um, and then bring it back on, obviously, for hit impacts and all that good stuff. And the net result is you get the same gameplay experience. Uh, you know, it feels exactly the same and all the behaviors uh, there that you want. Um, but a huge performance win. And this is something that I would actually recommend for our, our current project in development, um, another Oculus Quest title. We actually created a player proximity component to make this even simpler, not only for the engineers, but for the designers working in blueprints. It's just like, okay, cool, player's near me. Let me activate all my logic, like tick, and all that good stuff, right? It's especially useful in a single player game where you kind of know there's only one point right. of interest and you don't have to worry about you know, multi multiple multiplayer clients or whatever. But for us, it was a big win, especially in Robo Recall because Often the only things that you can interact with physically are things you can actually reach out and grab. So uh, yeah. Yeah, everything just worked pretty much. Yeah, and the other one that should be no surprise to anyone is collision is just slow in general. It's, you know, especially as you get higher poly counts and all that good stuff. Uh, so turning off overlap events, again, if they're not gameplay relevant, only enable them when you know the player is going to actually potentially do that. Um, it will save you a ton of time. I think. Uh, you know, one example is the, in the player, they have certain interaction spheres that they are like collision spheres for overlap with certain mission objectives. Well, it's like, I should only have that active when I'm actually in that mission, otherwise you're paying that cost, you know, every frame. Yeah, so now that your game is running in, uh, in budget and you're all happy, but you're running over memory, um, <laughs> this actually, we ended up solving the memory issues first, which I guess is probably more typical because when you run out of memory, you crash. crash yes. um, but in Robo Recall's case, it was a desktop title, didn't have to worry about memory at all, so they had like 3.2 gigabytes of sound loaded all the time, which is you know more than the budget that we had to work with in the first place. So a lot of what we did is just sort of break up hard references between all the classes because if everything references everything like it was initially when the game starts, everything is in memory all the time, and it has to be. So we ended up taking things like removing a direct cast to see if like is this a certain kind of bot, change it to an enum or something like that that doesn't require a memory reference. Um, and then uh, the other thing that's a huge win on Oculus Quest, which is kind of a, a, a weird thing for an Android platform, is that if you're using a 64-bit executable, uh, you have a, a wide range of memory uh, that you can address, so you have much less fragmentation issues. This actually was like a, a giant night and day difference for us, so it's definitely worth, worth it, it, and on Unreal, it's really just a, a switch flip, so unless you have some sort of third-party dependency that isn't 64-bit, there's no reason not to make your app 64-bit, and you'll have zero fragmentation issues and it'll save yourself a lot of time. So yeah, aside from that, we just sort of like, you know, did the usual thing and, and compressed audio where possible, turned on audio streaming for those really long queues. 
Uh, oh, I guess we should go to the next slide because there's more about this. Um, yeah, so the, the, only, the only downside to switching over to audio streaming is that you kind of have a CPU overhead of, of a stream that's playing, so you gotta manage what streams are playing concurrently, and, and this goes for any sound in general. Uh, so one of the things that we had to spend some time on is go through and um, make sure that we were very careful with audio concurrency to make, make things not you know, drop out at, at bad times or, or stop playing unnaturally, but still maintain a smaller voice count because we could only have about 16 voices playing at once on the device. Um, so one other tip if, if you're on Quest is that make sure you're using the new Epic audio mixer device. Uh, it's just an INI &I setting, but the old audio device, like Android audio device, is incredibly slow, and you'll hate yourself if you're trying to make and it work on crashy that. and Incre terrible yeah. <laughs> in every way possible. No, um, apologies to the programmer. Uh, yeah, the new one's better, and I hear it's getting even better in the next <laughs> engine. So yay, look at that. Um, and then yeah, we just had a lot of fun with just audio crashes in general. Some of the funs too, you know, Rubber Recall. We're working it before the platform had launched, so uh, yeah, exciting times. Uh, back to your game thread. Oh no, it's on fire again. Uh, by default, uh, Unreal. Well, by default, Unreal is, likes to enable all the things, uh, tick included, which is kind of a bad habit in a lot of respects when you care about performance. Um, so I highly recommend, where possible, just turn tick off by default when you're creating a new actor class or, or blueprint, um, and use event-driven models or delegates or whatever to, um, you know. Enable it when you actually need it. You know, the only time you need to update every frame usually is if it has a visual component. So if I'm lerping something to my virtual hand, obviously that needs to happen as often as possible. But something like, hey, is the player somewhat near me or something like that, you know, that can open much lower frequency, like 10 hertz, 20 hertz sometimes. Um, the hands, for example, in Robo Recall, updating the animation state, I think we end up shipping at like 45 hertz for the logic updates on those versus 90 hertz is what is shipped on the other platform with no visual difference, right? Um, and, and nice performance gains. Uh, and again, using that sort of proximity approach, that's, we got a lot of mileage out of that in, in Rubber Recall, and I'm sure you guys would have it in, in your titles as well, of just, hey, I'm nowhere near the player, he can't see me or whatever, um, turn off all the things, uh, it's just good. And the other one is this tried and true method of, of actor pulling, you know, instancing objects, components, actors, all that can be quite expensive and cause spikes in your game threads, which are never fun, uh, especially in VR, makes people sick usually. So using pooling for that, um, in Rubble Recall's case, the biggest one was moving the bullets over since they're such a high frequency spawning and destroying themselves. There's obviously some extra costs in that. You have to sort of design your classes and logic around being able to reinitialize that state correctly, um, but some huge gains on, on the game thread for sure. Uh, the other fun one here too is just components. You know, components are really handy, and we see a lot of our designers at Drifter use these just for like pre-visualization, getting the relative transform set up. Um, but reality is when you're moving an object through a scene, every one of those components has to have its transform updated as well. Uh, so there's a couple things you can do there. Obviously, deleting where possible, always recommended. Uh, and then uh, if you're using it just to pose objects, you know, I recommend cache that transform, like in the construction script or something, and then mark the component itself as is editor only, so that when you're in your packaged cook build, um, that component essentially doesn't exist, you're not paying those costs. Uh, and again, using a sort of detach unless you need it approach uh, is, is highly recommended. Um, I guess the example I used earlier of like, hey, here's a whole series of things attached to the hand every frame uh, that we only need in certain cases. And I think we went from like 20 components per hand to like less than 10 or something like that in shipping the rubber recall unplugged. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, deleting things. Yeah, it doesn't seem fun. like just updating the transform hierarchy would be a big deal. But when you're talking about hundreds of them happening every frame just for the player, uh, it started to add up. and. It's kind of an easy win. You can shave off like easy half win. millisecond, millisecond. But to go back to the game. support group, that's like the worst when you're like, okay, <laughs> frame is slow. What is it? Things moving. Well, what the hell do we do? You know, like do, do, delete the thing. The yeah, game. there we go. Um, how do you feel about half frame rate? <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, moving over to the rendering side of things. Uh, let's talk about render. This is the fun part with the quest. So. We, I touched on this earlier, but the, the main thing that we ran into with Robo Recall was just draw calls. Uh, it's really painful to try and get a big, expansive scene with lots of stuff going on, lots of pretty art everywhere that you want to be drawn. Uh, trying to fit it in, 250 draw calls at the very most is a painful thing. So the very first thing you should do is download RenderDoc. Um, luckily, Oculus has been pushing support back to the, you know, RenderDoc's like an open source tool, but they have, Oculus has been helping the guy that, that runs the project to make sure that it supports the Quest really well, including some of the new features that are coming along with, uh, with Vulkan and stuff like that. So you can actually, on the left there, you can see every draw call that is in your particular frame. You can step through it one by one and see where your draw calls are going. And often you'll be like, oh, this, 
I'm spending a draw call, one of 250 draw calls drawing like a planter that's inside a chair that you can't actually see. <laughs> so a lot of this is just like, cool, don't need that, delete, delete, delete. You know, go through and delete all the stuff that nobody's ever actually going to see. Or for example, you might have like a, a cable going around the room and the cable is like made up of modular bits, which is really nice for um, art workflow, but not so good for draw calls. So you can find those things and merge them all down into one mesh or you know, delete where necessary. Yeah. Uh, you, the other things you can do here is look at the GPU time of each, each particular draw call. The timings are not gonna be like actual accurate timings, but you can see uh, oh, proportionate to yeah. the other draw calls what, what the time is uh, being spent on. So you can see like, oh, this draw call of the elevator wall is five times more expensive than all the other draw calls, so that's probably time to go look at the shader, look at the material, see what it's doing, possibly look at how much uh, geometry is being pushed there. Another thing to point out too is, I don't know if you can read it, but there's you see the draw call and there's the in parentheses, which is the number of verts that are associated with that. Often if you see something like this where there's you know 372, 372, 372, it's drawing the same mesh over and over and over again. So that's a great time to go instance that mesh or merge that mesh or something. You know, it's, It probably can trim down a lot of draw calls just by grouping things together. Yeah, uh, RenderDoc is a fantastic tool and it works for many platforms, not just Oculus Quest, so I highly recommend using it if, if you haven't already. You also find a lot of uh, things, like on Oculus Quest, the default Unreal World material is quite expensive because of the instruction count. Um, and when you're building a level, invariably there'll be like a, a cube or random static meshes off to the side with that material still showing up in your frame, but you, obviously you don't even know they're there. So this is a great way to kind of track that stuff down and, and delete it with vengeance. One One quick tip for RenderDoc, um, the, the thing that you run into often is that you're gonna run out of memory when you're trying to capture yes. uh, because it requires a little bit extra memory. And if you're like Robo Recall and you're already using all the memory for the game. Uh, so if you're running into crashes when you're trying to get captures, Easy things to do are run with dash no sound. That'll drop all your sounds, give you some memory back. Uh, take the texture pool down to say 50 megabytes. That will affect some things. If you're if you're bandwidth bound, uh, you know it's going to be rendering lower te uh, resolution textures. But in our case, it almost never was bandwidth bound. So that way you can fit in your render dot capture, and uh, you don't have to like I don't know, delete a bunch of stuff in your level or make a weird test case. It helps a lot. Um, yeah. So. Oh. I would say another great tool in the engine, uh, it actually harkens to the older days of, of UE3 even, maybe even UE2, I don't know. Uh, Pre-computed visibility, it's basically, you know, on the Oculus, we don't have a hardware occlusion query, uh, uh, solution, and software occlusion is available, but of course that's gonna be slower, so pre-computed visibility allows you to basically do it, much like you'd bake lighting or whatever, understand where here's the play areas, you know, and it computes this graph of what can be visible from other areas. And this is a huge win for us. Um, but obviously there's trade-offs of, it only works for static geometry, it has no knowledge of all the dynamic things, so you gotta use it sparingly, or build custom uh, occlusion uh, solutions for those cases as well. Uh, but again, it's, it's pretty easy, it's really quick too, so it's definitely worth experimenting with, and the overhead, I don't know, maybe a minuscule amount of memory, but definitely. Yeah, it's, it's very, it was built for like mobile back in the UE3 days, so the CPU overhead and memory overhead are all really minimal. Good job, I think Daniel Wright wrote it originally. Oh, hats off to that guy. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so the other tool uh, that's a, happily is a built into the, into the engine is HLOD, uh, which we end up using sort of like as a one, one deep. Uh, we didn't have like several hierarchies. It was just kind of like once the player gets far enough away, it would switch to the HLOD proxies, uh, which is a great way to uh, reduce draw calls because, of course, once everything gets merged down, um, you're going to have one draw call for that cluster, ideally. Um, and then we also had pretty aggressive mesh simplification, which brought the the GPU overhead down as well. The thing to keep in mind here though is the more that you merge your level, the bigger your HLOD clusters are, the less opportunity for stuff to get called out is. So this, this balancing act is between the GPU and the draw calls, which is on the CPU. So if you got two big clusters, or like you, ideally you could merge your whole map into one giant draw call and now I have zero draw calls, great. But um, one, one draw call. it's gonna draw, well, one draw call, thanks, Obi-Wan. Um, and so, but that means that everything has to be drawn all the time, so the GPU is doing all the work no matter what. So you kind of have to like walk that line and it's gonna depend on your game and your level and what the sight lines are and all that stuff. And this is what we spent right up until ship just messing with. It's kind of like, okay, in this scene, the GPU is high, so make the clusters a little bigger, mess with it. Now yeah. the draw calls are high, eh. So you can kind of like manually move stuff around in clusters and play with it, but that it's something to be aware of and if you're, kind of confused, like I made draw call, I made the draw calls lower, I turned on HLOD, why isn't it the frame faster? It's probably this. Um, and there's actually a, a couple other trade-offs with HLOD worth mentioning. 
Um, a, build times uh, is non trivial. If you remember the good old days where building lighting took hours, um, the H lot is very similar. I think Perl, the first uh, major map for Robo Recall, took three or four hours on average for us, which it's, it's a little, uh, puts a kink in your iteration times, right? Um, and then, yeah, there's their size, memory, overhead. You know, it, it's, it's yeah. creating basically duplicate geometry, or not duplicate, but additional geometry and, and atlasing those textures and all that stuff. So um, definitely something that you're going to want to iterate on. But the nice thing is, is in the old days, this would basically be um, poor artists slaving away to sort of do this. And it would be a lot harder to kind of dial in exactly, OK, these are the groups that should be merged and so forth. Um, HLOT definitely makes this much better. And if, depending on the style of your game, if you're doing you know, open world like Fortnite, I think where the system was originated, you know, you're having multiple layers of LODs where you can sort of have your giant vistas you know, super simplified and all that good stuff. Um, in our case, just one. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, some other sort of things worth mentioning. We already talked about instruction counts, but it's worth talking about again. Uh, you really need to keep it around, you know, I don't know, 35 pro is probably a good target for instruction counts on your materials. Flip on that fully rough uh, checkbox, turn off directional lighting, everybody cries. Um, <laughs> it, just shave off every instruction that you possibly can because the GPU is not very fast. Um, the other thing that uh, is very difficult in a, in a fu futuristic shooter, especially with lots of translucent UI elements, is that Translucent materials are just really slow. It has to, it has to composite them differently, and it, it's almost not worth doing unless you absolutely have to do it. So we ended up switching almost everything to additive. I can't even think of, I don't know if there's anything yeah, translucent left. No, but. yeah, you, well, ideally drop to opaque if somehow magically you can do that and preserve the look, um, masked, and then additive is sort of your last resort. Um, but yeah, anything other than opaque is gonna incur some extra cost, so you have to be very mindful of it. And in VR, it's particularly a challenge because you always want like those score elements and various HUD elements always visible, and it's just almost like a permanent tax you have to deal with. And it's, you can get away with, with it pretty well and additive if you work with your artists and kind of like iterate on it a bit and do some trickery depending on the or scene you, being too dark or whatever. We just threatened, it was like, do you want it at all? Or <laughs> should I just delete it? I mean, what are you it's the delete key or <laughs> additive, which yeah. one you want. Yeah, any moment now, right? Uh, so the last, the last thing that was um, definitely worth doing is using, the Oculus has some built-in fixed foveated rendering f uh, features on the Quest. Um, the, the caveat being if, when it's at the maximum setting, which is, you know, hey, let's turn it on the maximum setting, get all that GPU back, it's quite visible and it's quite bad looking in the corners, especially kind of depends on what's in the scene, whether it's more visible or not. You, and it's, per, it's like a tile-based thing, so you see these big seams and it's really not very pretty. And, and especially when you're like in a UI or somewhere that's stationary and the player's eyes wander. Uh, so what we ended up doing is kind of a dynamic envelope system that would look at the, the last frame's GPU times and adjust the fixed foveated rendering setting depending on how much GPU time we had. Um, the only, and I would recommend that, it worked really well for us. The only thing to be aware of though is that on the Quest, <clears throat> the OS is constantly trying to downclock or upclock the CPU and the GPU to minimize battery life. Maximize uh, or battery. Maximize battery life. Um, <laughs> So uh, you can get into this weird thrashing situation where your code will turn down the fixed foveated rendering, which means the OS then thinks that it can turn the GPU down, and then you, know, you kind of like do this yeah. little circle dance. We ended up just locking the CPU and the GPU at maximum settings, which I don't think Oculus would recommend. But in that case, it sort of fixed this problem, and uh, we ended up having acceptable battery life even with that. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it is like, I guess, a, a constant balancing act of as much visual quality as you can get into the frame versus, you know, maintaining performance, um, which is never ending when it comes to making games. Uh, more thoughts. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of work to try to bring back as much lighting as possible and also to work around the fact that we were having to reduce the triangle counts of our assets quite a bit. You want to talk about the lighting changes? Yeah, so um, our, the artist that was working with us, Kenneth Scott, he's our art director, did some amazing uh, bake downs, which you'll see in, in a bit. Um, but what that meant was we got a much reduced poly count on all of our characters, which is great for the GPU. Uh, but, uh, and then we ended up baking the lighting into the diffuse texture so that you didn't, you know, it looked higher poly than it was. The issue is when you're in a dynamic lighting scenario, the, the shading on those polys, like you see the seams that aren't supposed to be there. Um, so what we ended up doing is changing the character shader a little bit to uniformly uh, light the entire character as one so that you still got some kind of nice uh, changes on the characters as they went from shadow to, to light, but you didn't notice the crimes as much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it ended up working out really well for us, uh, you, you know, as, especially when you're just playing the game and you're not really scrutinizing it. The characters still look good, but it, it doesn't look wrong when they're in shadow. It doesn't look wrong when they're you know, bright. You don't see like glowing guys off in the corner or anything. Yeah. So that, that was a nice win. Um, 
And then I've talked about this before already, but we ended up using the RHI thread, which some people are um, nervous to do because it does incur some, some latency to the frame. Uh, but for us, it meant you know, another 30 or 40% draw calls, which was a huge win. So if you're, if you're finding yourself really fighting with those draw calls, it's definitely worth turning off. Yeah, I think it worked really well in Robo Recall's case. Because it's so physically based, it's using a lot of constraints when it's grabbing and manipulating. Um, so the golden rule usually with VR is you want one for one of like, my hand in real life is here, therefore my virtual hand is there. Robo Recall breaks that or bends that rule quite a bit. And so there's sort of a natural latency to the gameplay that if we have a little latency in the frames, I think it all sort of still feels the same level of responsiveness. But again, some, some cases it may not to, or work too well for your title. Um, I think the one thing uh, on UMG2, we had quite a few, hopefully this bug is fixed, but we had some wonderful things like uh, tutorial UMG widgets, which would pop up for three seconds or whatever and disappear, quote unquote, still sitting there stacking up. Um, and those would, uh, I think this is due to a bug in the compositor, right, for Oculus Quest? Well, it's not exactly a bug. A feature? Know. We'll call <laughs> it a bug. But so there's, you'd have these widget components, which the UMG was not drawing anything. So you'd look at the draw call, and it's, it's literally affecting zero pixels. But it still ends up getting composited on the GPU side, so it, you know that's like a millisecond or so. And uh, the game was leaking these things. So as you play the level, more and more would stack up, and the GPU time would get slower and slower, and you have no idea what's going on because there's nothing different in the frame. But that's again where render doc is going to be your best friend because we ended up doing getting some render doc captures, and you just see these big like 2,000 by 2,000 quads that are not doing anything to the frame. You're like, what? Anyway, so. That's something to be aware of. Yeah, that, that was a fun bug because for like, I think it was a good month, we'd have like a QA tester in Montreal say, the game's running at 30 frames a second. We'd fire up the map and like, no, it's running at 72. What are you talking about? And it was because he would like play, restart, play, restart, and those things just stack up, stack up. So uh, the joys of shipping, right? Um, and then we touched on this as well. The, uh, you know, because of the full scene resolve tax, we'll say, you know, four milliseconds. Uh, Post-process is basically off the table unless you really build your visual style to accommodate for that budget. Um, but it sounds like with you know Vulcan coming online and the work there, I don't believe it's 100% quite ready for Oculus Quest, but it's really close. And, it will be soon. Yeah. yeah, it's something that we're working on for our next title. Uh, it it will. It's not a magic bullet. You're not going to get like blurs uh, or things that affect p pixels around each pixel. But for something like a tone mapper that is a you know one pixel modification kind of post-process. Vulcan subpasses will actually get you most of the way there. So that's an exciting thing to look forward to if you're working on Quest. Cool. All right, and uh, our last section, we're going to break down just some of the content examples. Uh, I guess I should say neither one of us are artists, so I apologize. <laughs> we're code artists. <laughs> Please don't ask any hard art questions. Um, so yeah, it's, like I said, it's rolling back to those sort of 360-style uh, uh, budgets, you know, coming down from these beautiful models of 42,000 polygons to or triangles to 5,700 um, and still trying to preserve the look. Uh, yeah, so various characters, same thing with the guns and the weapons. Hopefully all the artists in the room are like, oh, that's so cool. How would you guys do that? I don't know. Sorry, artists that worked on the original game. Yeah, magic. <laughs> yeah. We, we tried our best. It looks well, pretty good. Is though. that why they were giving me evil glares? <laughs> Um, and somebody with the, uh, the biped, the, the main character of the game. You can also see there where, um, yeah, due to our, our limitations on instruction counts and so on, we had to basically bake everything. So you have those four beautiful 2K textures and things called normal maps, uh, just kind of crushing them old school uh, to sort of achieve a similar look. That combined with our, our lighting uh, modifications um, to sort of, it, it really is very similar to like those UE3 early days of the you know, transitioning between light and dark and all that good stuff. But fortunately, when you're in the action, and especially in, in VR, it has that extra immersion, um, I, I think it still holds up pretty well. Um, and here's just a, some final examples. You can see the top, that one. That's sort of the original Rift version of that, and the one below, what we got roughly close to. Um, and again, with that hand model, that's a, a huge reduction. But we were able to keep all the articulation and all that. Uh, one other thing we unfortunately had to trim out as well, which is a cool visual effect, is a lot of the physical dangly bits. You know, we love to dangle everything off everything. It's a no-go. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and I guess if it's not obvious out of this whole experience, you know, Robo Recall, um, they intentionally uh, adopt this sort of for photogrammetry, photoreal uh, uh, visual style because it looks great on the desktop. If you were building a tile from scratch for Oculus Quest, I would highly, highly recommend going with something very uh, stylized because that just allows you to be um, just you put the budget where you actually want to, right? Where it's going to have the most impact. Um, there's a lot of tax of, and there's just some scenes that are going to be incredibly difficult to still be able to maintain uh, the, the style that you want if you're going photo real. Yeah. yeah, this is the hub from Robo Recall after all the optimizations were made. It's kind of a nice scene because there's a bunch of bots. Well, it was terrible for us because there's a bunch of bots <laughs> on screen all at once. 
and a bunch of uh, clutter in the in the level and everything like that. But we were pretty happy with where it ended up. It's not you know it's not one to one, but it, I think it still looks good. And we we sort of captured the essence of what was there in the Rift title. So yeah. And the other fun thing is when you're uh, going through somebody else's code base as rigorously as you have to to port a game like this, you find all the Easter eggs. And there were some very clever ones. Good <laughs> job, Ryan. Good job, Jeremy. No. Um, anyways, I, I think that kind of wraps up our, our piece of this. So thank you. <laughs>